I'm Robert Ermel. I am the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. And this is the policy pizza and a pint on the Senate, change your status quo. Uh, we pride ourselves on being topical, and we may have been a little overly successful today, as one of our guests was just on TV in Ottawa. Uh, he cannot make it, uh, Senator Don Platt, because the, uh, the Senate is sitting tonight. It was not supposed to be sitting, but it is sitting, and he uh, sends his regrets. Um, he would really wish he could be here this evening. Um, but uh, instead, we're going to have uh, a different panel, but it will still be an interesting dialogue. Um, we have two very distinguished panelists this evening. We have, uh, on my right, um, the Honorable James Allen, Minister of Education and Advanced Learning for the province of Manitoba. Uh, Mr. Allen was first elected in 2011 as the MLA for Fort Garry Riverview. He holds a PhD in Canadian and Environmental History from Queen's University. Uh, prior to uh, being elected, he was uh, with the City of, City of Winnipeg in their archives and uh, Chief Administrative Officer Secretary. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. Um, and he also taught part-time in the Department of History at the University of Winnipeg, uh, served as the Chair of the Manitoba Heritage Council, and in 2008 he was named Chair of the Council on Post-Secondary Education for the Province of Manitoba. Uh, he's also, uh, in his private member's capacity, it was this prior to uh, becoming minister? It was prior. Prior to becoming minister, he introduced the government of Manitoba's uh, uh, bill uh, in regards to the Senate. So that's where he would be presenting from. To my left is Dr. Royce Coop. Uh, Royce is an assistant professor at the Department of Political Studies here at the University of Manitoba. Prior to joining the University of Manitoba, he held postdoctoral doctoral positions at Memorial University, Queen's University, and Carleton University, and was an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser University. He writes about political parties, representation, municipal politics, federalism, online and online political communication. He teaches courses on Canadian government and politics. Uh, his book, Grassroots Liberals, Organizing for Local and National Politics, examines the constituency organizations of Canada's national and provincial liberal parties, and how political parties adapt their organizations to federalism. His forthcoming co-edited volume, Parties, Elections, and the Future of Canadian Politics, explores change in Canada's national party system. And certainly that's what we'll be talking tonight, is the potential for change within the Senate system. So uh, this evening, the two uh, panelists up here will each uh, speak for a while and situate uh, the Senate from their uh, professional uh, positions and uh, from where the province of Manitoba is going. And then uh, Mary Agnes Welch, uh, from the Winnipeg Free Press uh, will moderate a discussion with their panelists. So sit back and enjoy. And don't forget the pizza and the pint. Well, uh, thank you. We were just trying to decide here which of the two of us would go first. And I don't know if I won the coin flip or how that worked, but he's uh, deferring to me. Anyway, so thank you for that, uh, Royce. Uh, I'm honored to be here today to see such a great audience. I, you have to know that uh, debate over Senate reform in Canada would bring people out of the woodwork. So uh, I'm happy that you're all here. And for those of you out in uh, computer and TV land, I'm glad that you're here as well. Uh, uh, Robert was quite right in saying that uh, I put forward a motion uh, in the legislature during the last extended session of the provincial legislature uh, simply to abolish uh, the Senate, and that could probably end my, my speech now. Uh, but I'll go on to explain sort of the context for me, and it is actually was fun for me because it allowed me to go back and be a historian for a while. And uh, that always brings me a great deal of pleasure. But when you think about the conditions for which the Senate uh, was created, uh, it's fair to say that they no longer exist. So they, I think most of you in the room would know that it's been the long-standing CCF NDP position to abolish the Senate. If you look at the Regina Manifesto, you're going to find abolish the Senate in there. So nothing what I'm saying is actually new. Uh, but if you revisit the original terms upon which the, the Senate was created, uh, it was first, uh, there was no secret that Johnny McDonald featured a, a, a favored a, a very centralized uh, national union, a legislative union, as they call it in, in the history books. He envisioned the role of the provinces to be as about as powerful as their average municipality in the 19th century, which is to say the provinces would be not powerful at all. 
And uh, so consequently, the Senate uh, is a product of the fear of uh, regional interests not being properly protected. So the Senate is created because the provinces aren't considered to be powerful to protect regional interests in the absence of the strong provincial uh, governments. And then the second issue uh, is that, uh, as we know, when you think about Canada in 1867, it's really a pre-democratic <coughs> achievement at that point. Democracy is not exactly flourished in this country. And so consequently, uh, the Senate is considered to be a, an elitist check on representative democracy. Well, I would argue, and it's quite clear, that none of those conditions exist today at all. Provinces have clearly filled the board for regional representation, and we don't need a Senate to provide uh, that kind of context. And even when we, we think of the latest spectacle of the Senate right now, and one of the senators purporting to be representing Prince Edward Island, but maybe not, and one purporting to represent Saskatchewan, I think, but probably not, Really, we have to accept the fact that the Senate does not exist in Canada uh, for the purpose of, of protecting regional interests anymore. So, condition number one doesn't exist, one reason to it. Secondly, it would be hard to argue now, uh, I think, that anyone would envision that we needed uh, an elitist check on democracy in Canada in the second decade of the 21st century. I mean, that seems preposterous to me. So, condition number two for the creation of the Senate no longer exists as well, as well. So my final point would simply to be to talk about the elected Senate just a little bit. Uh, there was an all-party uh, committee that went out uh, in the province, I think in about 2009. They came back and said, well, you know, if we want to abolish the Senate, the least we can do is have an elected Senate. I suppose if that's the direction, if we can't get uh, some kind of consensus around abolishing the Senate, maybe an elected Senate is a good idea. I personally don't hold to that position. The last thing we need in government in Canada is more government. And it would shock me to think that the right wing in Canada, which is represented by the current federal government, I suppose, and, and coming from the Reform Party, would, would also want more government in Canada. We only have to look south to see the spectacle of gridlock in the US between the House of Representatives and the Senate to know that there's nothing valuable there either about an elected Senate. In fact, it would, it would only create more red tape and slow the legislative agenda down even more than it currently is. So for me, the idea of abolishing the Senate really doesn't have too much to do with the latest shenanigans going on in Ottawa right now. In fact, uh, they only create the timing for the resolution and no other reason. In fact, it's the original conditions for the uh, creation of the Senate no longer exist and consequently it seems to me it makes sense to abolish it. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you're, you're all about to uh, find out that my voice is about uh, this far from coming to an end, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> hope to make it through this and uh, stick to my notes a little bit more than, uh, than I usually would. I think uh, we need to be clear about what the Senate actually does um, so that we can, we can evaluate it and, and sort of a clear-headed map decide whether or not it should be a reform. Or, or abolish. Some guy on Twitter today uh, said that the, the Senate is like your appendix. It's uh, irrelevant all the time until it starts to cause problems. Then it becomes like so that's a really good analogy. But and I'm, not, I'm not totally sure I agree. Sorry, 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 but the Senate gets lots of coverage when bad things happen, as we're discovering now. But when the Senate does good things, it gets no coverage. A lot of the good things that the Senate does is actually pretty low profile. So I wanted to look at the, uh, the two major functions. The first is that the Senate uh, acts as the quote, uh, the House of Sober Second Thought. Now that doesn't mean that they oppose a lot of legislation that comes out of the House of Commons. They don't. They did oppose the GST, which may put the Senate in your good books. It certainly does in mine. But they don't do a lot of that. What they do do is they tinker with legislation that comes to them from the House of Commons in committee, Senate committee. They invite witnesses, uh, they deliberate, they work on legislation that comes from the House of Commons, and I think they improve the legislation that, that ends up in Senate committees quite a bit. And this role, I'd argue, has become even more important in the last decade as the House of Commons went through its period of minority governments and, and really intense partisanship and gamesmanship in the House. And in a lot of ways, that feeling, that kind of sentiment infiltrated the House of Commons committees. Um, uh, conflict is good in question period in the House of Commons. It's meant to be that way.
but in committees it's bad, and it infiltrated the House of Commons committees, but that's not the case in the Senate. The Senate, uh, where senators are, are insulated from politics in a lot of ways, they're insulated from re-election. In that case, committees have been much more productive. They stayed the way they're supposed to, and so this role of a house of sober second thought has continued to be important. So the second function is uh, uh, the one that was already mentioned, uh, is the, the role that the Senate plays in representing the regions. I should say that every federation in the world, just about, is characterized by, we call by cameralism. They have a lower house and an upper house. The idea is that in a federation there should be representation of individuals in the lower house and then regions in the upper house. So the idea isn't weird, it's not undemocratic, it's very standard in a federation that this is the way that things would be organized. So the best example, the most prominent example is the United States, where every state gets two senators. Wyoming with 500,000 people, in California with 38 million people. They both get two senators, and those two senators are expected to stand up for the interests of their state. The idea being that Wyoming, the interests of Wyoming shouldn't be overrun, they shouldn't be run roughshod over by more populous states like California. Now, if you replace the word Wyoming with Manitoba, you replace California with Ontario and Quebec, you start to think about maybe why this kind of upper house might be important to people like us that live in less populous provinces like Ontario. So efforts at reform, they've always been aimed at enhancing these functions of the Senate. Uh, take, for example, the Triple E Senate. The idea here is that if senators are elected, they'll suddenly have democratic legitimacy. They'll be less likely to just accept whatever the House of Commons sends them. They'll actually start sending things back. So the second sober thought rule would become more important, it would become stronger. It would also become different because all of a sudden senators would be subject to the pressures of re-election. And of course the equality provision of Tripoli would ensure that senators would no longer represent regions, they'd represent provinces, every province sending the same number of senators to Ottawa. So if you put those things together, you realize you have a very different set of governing institutions in Ottawa, very different kinds of politics with a Senate that's much stronger and performing very different roles in Ottawa. So, I, w I wanted to close uh, with more of a thought to, to, uh, to generate debate to speak to what's happening in the Senate uh, right now. I think that one of the more regrettable aspects of the, the coverage of, of all this, this, this huge mess, uh, particularly over Senator Wallen, Pamela Wallen, was when she said that she was an activist Senate, by which she meant that she traveled to Saskatchewan a lot, she listened to lots of people, she tried to act on certain issues that were important to her. When she used that term, act of a senator, how did reporters respond? Well, they just kind of laughed. We all kind of laughed and cheered and said, oh yeah, yeah, act of a senator. But the truth is, I think it's important that we recognize that there are activist senators who do important work as legislators and representatives, and they should actually be encouraged to do so and recognize when they do do so. I think one of the dangers to me uh, of this recent coverage of spending issues is that senators will be afraid to travel. They'll be afraid to engage on certain issues. They'll be afraid to stand up for their constituents. They'll essentially be afraid to be activists. And that would be, I think, really regrettable. In a lot of ways, I think by strongly condemning Duff and, or sorry, Duffy, Wallen, and uh, Brazil, we're kind of condemning ourselves to a Senate uh, that in fact is quite a bit cooler than it actually has to be in Canada.